turn it over to him. Thanks, Will, and, and thanks everyone for, for coming along. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, we're going to talk um, today really about brachycephalic dogs. And it's not so much a lecture on surgical repair of brachycephaly. I can do that another time. What I really want to talk about is the welfare of these dogs. Um, and it's a big issue in society today. Uh, and I will discuss this with you. And at the end, I'm going to ask you for your help to, for, to help me change these little dogs. Um, because I think that's very important. We do need to change the phenotype of these dogs or the shape of these dogs. So when we're talking about brachycephalic dogs, the first thing is you can't manage um, brachycephalic cases or really indeed any cases unless you work with a team. And this is my team of nurses uh, at our conference recently. And they are a wonderful group of, of people and their our outstanding success rate with these little dogs is not down to me, but to my team, to the people who support and look after the dogs, um, as well as um, as well as the surgery that I do. Um, little conflict of interest. I don't have any conflict of interest or any organisation or entity, no financial or non-financial interest in the subject. Um, but I do love brachycephalic dogs. This was my my beloved Doug, he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and I've always had pugs. Uh, I think they're great little dogs, but they do have their problems. Before I start on brachycephaly, I just wanted to have a little word about um, the, the nasopharynx of the dog in general, and the brachycephalyx as well. So this is the nasopharynx of a dog, all right? Cross section, just a drawing, that's fine. So, Air goes down here, goes through the nose, down the trachea. That's all good. Food, however, goes through the mouth and down the esophagus. Now, who thought this was a good idea? Who thought it was a good idea that the, the air and the food go through the same hole? And we have, you know, ongoing issues with aspiration pneumonia and other problems. And, you know, this design is not a good thing. So man isn't at blame for all the brachycephalic problems. I think evolution or, or, or God is also at blame. And when we look at our brachycephalic dogs, okay, this doesn't help. That Breeding these dogs with shorter noses hasn't improved it. We've still got this problem, but we've also got additional problems like long soft palates, stenotic noses, aberrant nasal turbinates, and so on. So this isn't the solution to that problem. And then I got to thinking one day, maybe the aquatic, mammals are different but sadly not when you look at a killer whale a dolphin they still have this problem air goes through one way and it crosses over where food comes from anyway that's a bit of an aside but it's always been a bugbear of mine that that design was never good so brachycephalic airway syndrome brachycephalic obstructive airway cement same thing um different name uh, some people refer to it as an obstructive syndrome. I don't. I think it's just brachycephalic airway syndrome. All the dogs have the problem. Um, you know, it's very rare for me to see a brachycephalic dog without significant airway issues. Now, how do I define that? When I assess these dogs, and I, you need to anaesthetize them to assess the upper airways, um, we open the mouth. Um, have a look down there. The dog needs to be fairly heavily sedated or, or even anaesthetized. And what we're looking at is the length of the soft palate. Does it extend beyond the, 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 the caudal aspect of the tonsils? Are the tonsils enlarged or hyperemic? Is there pharyngeal um, edema and mucosa? But most importantly, I look in the larynx. Have we, have we got good laryngeal function? And do we have edematous laryngeal ventricles? Now, edematous laryngeal ventricles a stage one laryngeal collapse. And if a dog has that, then it has obstructive airway disease and it needs to have surgical improvement. <clears throat> it does need surgery to have it improved. But you, the only part of a dog's airway you can really assess without, with a dog conscious are its nostrils. So has it got stenotic nares as the start? But for me, 
the, 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 the thing I really want to look at is the edema of the laryngeal ventricles. Okay. Um, so where do the brachycephalic beads come from? Now, I don't mean a mummy and a daddy pug who loved each other very much. Let's have a look at the origin of the breeds of all dogs. So dogs are descended from wolves, probably about 27, 30,000 years ago. And almost all dogs are descended from the modern gray wolf, which is quite interesting, except for some of the Arctic breeds, the Malamutes, the Canadian Eskimo dog, Greenland dog, Husky, and so on. They're descended from the tamer wolf, which is a slightly different wolf. But um, as I say, domestication began about 27,000 years ago, maybe 30,000 years ago. And that comes from um, a paper in Nature some time ago um, by Lin Bad To, which looked at the origin of dogs. Okay, and I apologize for any creationists, but the majority of dogs are descended from wolves. So we've taken a wolf and we've managed to develop this. <laughs> So that's a bulldog, a British bulldog. And, and I asked myself, how did we get to this point in the evolution of the domestic dog? How do we take a, a wolf that survived in the wild for hundreds of thousands of years and develop a dog like this little guy who can't breathe? Now that dog's not in any distress, um, didn't over-exercise, it just came into the hospital like that, okay, unable to breathe. And the, the noise you can hear in these dogs is air reverberation around the soft palate and the dog's inability to breathe is associated with its inability to get air passage through the nasopharynx. When we look at the skull of a modern gray wolf and a Labrador, they're pretty similar. Okay, so the, the doliocephalic dogs are quite similar to a wolf. Um, domestic dogs, um, they tend to be a little bit smaller than a wolf and they also have smaller brains because in reality, you don't need much of a brain to be fed by someone else, uh, whereas a domestic, whereas a wolf has to go and catch things and eat them, um, usually quite difficult. So when we look at the domestic dog, we started with the wolf, and um, these wolves started to hang around man. Sometimes they were caught. Uh, as pups, they were used for hunting, but they still stay in a similar sort of animal. And over the, 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 the development of man over the centuries, they changed to a point where we started to select them specifically as companion animals rather than working animals. So we started with a, with a, a wolf and we've developed um, most of the changes in the last three to 4,000 years. That's when most of our breeds have developed, but probably uh, in the last 300 years. Um, so we've taken the wolf and we've turned it into a little guy who can't manage without oxygen. And we can have a little laugh at the pug with nasal oxygen, but I do have clients whose dogs can't go outside without oxygen. And it's a, it's, it's a very sad thing. Okay, so how did this happen? How did we start with uh, natural selection and we started with a wolf been around for a long time and in natural selection we have the strongest the smartest the best colored best breeding the healthiest maybe even the luckiest dogs survive okay and then we introduced artificial selection so we start to select for certain traits okay and in our selection process, we've chosen things that we liked, not things that are necessary for survival. So we've started with this and we've developed this. Now, can you spot the difference? I think only one of those is gonna survive for very long in the forest. Now, I'm not saying the little Pekingese on the right's not a dear little dog. Um, he is, he's a lovely little dog, but it's, there's a big difference between those two animals. So we have many, many dog breeds. The majority of them have appeared in the last 700 years. Prior to that time, dogs were for hunting. <clears throat> Since that time, they've become companion animals. 
And what have we done? We've made a lot of problems. We've selected for specific things. And being a surgeon, people, if you mention a breed to me, I can tell you the issues that they have. You know, German Shepherds, we see lots of hip dysplasia. Labradors, elbows, hips as well. Um, little Dachshunds, spinal disease. And this is all because of the way we've selected the dogs. Um, but today's focus is on the brachycephalic breeds. So what are the brachycephalic breeds? These are the brachycephalic breeds. Um, and there are many of them. Uh, some are worse than others. Probably the worst dogs for airway issues that I see, the British Bulldog, the Pug, Boston Terrier, and the, um, the French Bulldog. And the French Bulldog is incredibly popular these days. All right. Um, we also see the Australian Bulldog. I don't know if you see them in, in, in the States, but um, they only developed in the last, in the last 20 years, really, have, have Australian Bulldogs been um, uh, regarded as a breed. I don't know why we needed another brachycephalic breed, but that's not my decision. So we took this majestic animal and we made this. Okay, so what we did was we tried to make a little face that looks like a human. Okay, so that the, we've shortened and compressed the, the, the face, the incisive. <coughs> excuse me. Nasal, maxilla, mandibular bones. We compressed the associated soft stru tissue structures, and this has far reaching effects. And these changes have occurred um, over a short period of time. This is a British Bulldog on the left in 1870, and this is a British Bulldog in 2010. You can see there's a, a massive difference. Now in 1870, <clears throat> British Bulldogs were still used as fighting dogs. Okay, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that's what they were bred for. Um, they were bred for, for baiting bulls. Um, they were, so they still were used for that. They had shorter snouts because they got less injuries when they were fighting. Um, the um, we have over 140 years really compressed that um, those that upper jaw to a point where the dogs um, are no longer functional. So with brachycephalic dogs, I have two big issues. One's brachycephalic airway syndrome, and the other one is hemivertebra. And this is what occupies most of my working day. Okay, every day at work, this is what I deal with. So the primary anatomical abnormalities in brachycephalic airway syndrome are the stenotic nares, the elongated soft palate, the hyperplastic trachea's, the atresia of the chonal region, macroglossa, the big tongue we see in these dogs, and something we're recognizing more recently is, is obstructive nasal turbinate disease. Um, and we're recognizing that more recently because we're now CTing these dogs. So if we can correct these early in the dog's life, we tend to have second, less secondary changes. If we don't correct them early or improve them early, improve airflow early, we develop secondary changes. And the secondary changes we see um, are edematous or swollen laryngeal ventricles, collapse of the larynx, or progression of collapse of the larynx, edematous laryngeal ventricles, as I said earlier, at stage one laryngeal collapse. Stage two and stage three, a progressive collapse of the cartilages. Pharyngeal hyperplasia, tracheal collapse, bronchial disease, bronchial collapse, chonal collapse, and also our gastrointestinal issues, hiatal hernia, gastroesophageal reflux. And many of these dogs will go on to develop um, increased pulmonary resistance and right-sided cardiac disease. And this is associated with the fact that the dog is struggling to breathe. Its inspiration is difficult. It has trouble breathing in. So let's look at some sagittal CTs. This is a, a um, doliocephalic dog, Labrador, German Shepherd, just a, a, just a dog. Okay, we see a long nose, um, our nasal turbinates, <coughs> and a nice thin soft palate. All right, we also see we have um, the sinuses, the normal nasal sinuses that a dog's had. So what does a CT of a brachycephalic dog look like? It looks like this. We've lost those nasal sinuses. We've compressed our turbinates. We've got a very thick soft palate. And you can see the soft palate there extends beyond the epiglottis. Um, and we also have macroglossa. The tongue is much larger and thicker. 
All right, so in breeding that, we've developed a little dog that has trouble breathing in. They have trouble getting the air in. So it's not normal for a dog to sound like that. Okay, some people say to me, oh, it's normal for the breed. It's not normal. Okay, that dog's having trouble breathing. So when we hear dogs like that, it's really important to point out to owners that the dog has problems. It has problems getting air in and it um, does require or should have surgery to help with its breathing. But um, saying that's normal for the breed takes away the problem that the dog has inspiratory distress. Okay, the dog can't breathe well. So wolf to pug, there's a, a comparison of the two skulls. There's a big difference. All right. So this very, very brief talk about obstructive upper airway syndrome. Our next slide is this little guy. Okay. Now, this is a problem that we see in our little brachycephalic friends, the spinal abnormalities. Now, I know this is no one's best angle for a photograph but what's wrong here and the problem is the little screw tail that the dogs have been bred with so what does should a tail look like the tail should have up to 23 vertebrae and be a nice long thing that a dog can wag all right and what is a, a british bulldog pug boston terrier um, french bulldog tail look like it doesn't look like that it looks like that so we've developed little dogs with screw tails, so they have abnormal vertebrae in the tail. Now, whoever thought this was a good idea didn't realize that when you develop abnormal vertebrae in some areas of the spine, you also introduce those same abnormalities of the vertebra in other areas. So in taking a little, a long curly tail like we see on the left, that the dog can wag and developing a little fused stump as we see on the right we have introduced spinal abnormalities so we're going to look at a dog's spine now admittedly this is a dachshund it's got disc disease it's also got a large bladder calculus but i'm not worried about the bottom half of the screen what i'm looking at is the normal shape of the vertebra little rectangles Okay, vertebral bodies, little rectangles that sit nicely. Okay, um, and they work reasonably well until we have disc problems. But again, we're not focusing on that. Um, so what does a brachycephalic dog's spine look like? Many of them look like this. They have what are called hemivertebra, abnormalities of the vertebral bodies. And this dog has them between T6 and T9. So instead of the little vertebra being rectangular in shape, they're wedge-shaped or butterfly-shaped or many other abnormalities. And these are present in 80% in or more of French Bulldogs. Okay, and, and also in high incidence in the other breeds as well. And we're currently publishing a paper on the incidence of these breeds in Australia. When we CT them, we can see um, these issues. Now, when we look at the image on the left, instead of there being little rectangular vertebrae, you can see these really grossly abnormally shaped, wedge-shaped, butterfly-shaped, abnormally positioned half vertebra, another butterfly shaped um, in the dog's spine. Okay. Now, this is 100% heritable. This dog has puppies, its puppies will have abnormal vertebra, guaranteed, okay? And the dog, sadly, on the left, is an imported, expensive breeding dog. So it's going to be bred with, and it's going to have, its puppies are going to have problems. Why do they cause problems? Because these little vertebra luxate. Now, this is a poor little pug, his name was Hercules, who has pretty severe hind limb ataxia, and that's associated with luxation of his vertebra 
and you can see his MRI and his CT there, um, the vertebra has luxated and is causing compression of his spinal cord. Now, on the only good thing about this is it rarely causes pain because it's a chronic luxation. So even though he's ataxic, he can't walk very well, he's, um, uh, he's not in, in pain. But we can generally help the majority of these dogs. What we have to do though, is as we've done here, we have to go in surgically, remove the compression and fuse the vertebra. Okay, it's a difficult and major surgery. Okay, and it's not as much fun as you'd think. So that's hemivertebra. Um, and they're, 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 they're something that does significantly annoy me because they're so heritable. There's lots of other brachycephalic um, issues that we see in brachycephalic dogs. And let's have a look at some of those. So what other issues are there? Um, we see many of them. Okay, I started to write a list and um, I'll show you that list in a moment. This is a little pug and the thing that is a dear little dog, a really, really friendly little chap, but the thing that gets me is that the most rostral portion of any animal should not be its, its skin fold. It should be the end of its nose. In this little dog, the um, issue is the dog's skin fold is the most cranial part of the dog. So what problems do we see in these dogs? Um, there's a bit of a list here. It's not an exclusive list or an exhaustive list, but it does list many of the problems we see in these animals. And they are quite significant, and we do see a large number of them. Um, so let's look at a couple. Firstly, can these dogs breed? Majority of them can't. Majority of uh, British Bulldogs, for example, are born by caesarean section. Um, there was a paper from the UK that looked at this and they found that the vast majority of uh, British Bulldogs, 84% of British Bulldogs puppies were born by caesarean section. Okay, that's not a good proportion of dogs. Dogs should be able to breed without issue. Um, do they live a long life? No, not really. The majority of brachycephalic dogs live shorter lives than um, all other breeds. And if we compare them, extreme brachycephalic dogs, pugs, bulldogs, Bostons, Frenchies, um, their, their, their average age length is about 8.6 years. Some of them live longer, I fully acknowledge that, but the average years, and this study found that the average age at death of non-brachycephalic uh, dogs in that group was 12 years. So they don't live very long. They certainly don't live a, a, a full and, and happy life. Um, so that's a brief overview of some of the issues. Uh, I can talk another day about the specific surgical correction of brachycephalic dogs, but what I want to focus today is about the welfare of these dogs. So these are the five freedoms for animals, okay? The universally recognized issues associated with um, welfare for animals. And when we look at this list, what are the ones that we can say we can rely, that brachycephalic dogs uh, have freedom from reliably? And I would say that we feed them and give them food and water, but they do have chronic problems with discomfort, with pain, illness, and disease associated with their airways and other problems. They can't really express normal behavior, certainly in a warm or humid environment, because if they try and run around and ex exercise and become active, they become, they, they develop respiratory distress. And these dogs do develop respiratory distress and become quite uncomfortable. So our five freedoms for animals, we only provide one of them for the brachycephalic dogs reliably. And I'd suggest to you that that dog is not enjoying itself. Um, so some interesting facts. Um, in the UK, the Kennel Club has reported a 3,000% increase in French Bulldogs. And they're actually, in 2018, the French Bulldog became the most popular breed in the UK and that's a worldwide uh, change as well. The, the, the brachycephalic dogs are becoming very, very popular.
Okay, why is that? Why have we all of a sudden decided that I won't have a Labrador, I won't have a German Shepherd, um, I won't have another uh, Border Collie, I'll have a Brachycephalic dog. So let's look at some of the reasons. Okay, their appearance, people like their appearance. Okay, um, they like the little squashed face. They're, they're very popular. Um, that's my mate, Hugh Jackson. Hugh's a really good guy. He has a, a French bulldog. They're very good with children. It's rare to see an aggressive or unhappy or, or nasty French bulldog or brachycephalic dog. They're great companion animals. People like them. They're good little dogs to live in apartments. Um, they don't, generally don't need much exercise because they can't exercise. And as I said, my mate Hugh Jackson has one as well. So when celebrities own dogs, people like to have the same dog as the celebrity. Okay. Otherwise, why would they use celebrities in advertising? Okay, this is this is, is interesting. This is a a graph from one of the pet insurance companies in Australia. The graph on the left are problems associated with brachycephalic dogs. And the graph on the right is all other dogs. And you can see that obviously the brachycephalic dogs have a lot of a lot of claims associated with their brachycephaly, which is the column with the circle around it. Um, upper airway disease is pretty rare in other breeds, but they also have problems in many, many other areas as evidenced by these claims. Okay, now in the UK, there's a working group which is made up of people from the Royal College, so some academics, dog clubs, the veterinary profession, kennel clubs, uh, animal charities, owners, breeders, and veterinary surgeons. And this group has got together, they were developed in 2016, and this is a really admirable, um, admirable uh, concept to try and improve the welfare of brachycephalic dogs. And they developed a statement that they agreed that these problems is, is, uh, do exist in the dog, that they do have airway issues associated with their anatomical defects. Okay, so that point one is really important. They agree that that's a problem. They agree that there are skin problems, that there are eye problems, that they have trouble giving birth. Um, they are a bit undecided on point five, that vertebral body malformations associated with, uh, with the screw tail breed, we know that it is, but um, still, it's a really good start. Um, okay, so the goals of this group were to try and improve these breeds so that we have a, um, the, 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 the negative aspects of an impact of brachycephaly will be improved over time. And they, if you read through some of the literature, and you can, I won't go through all these slides, there's a lot of words in them, but um, they want to promote um, selective and breeding of healthy animals, which is really good. They have a scoring scheme. Um, most of the dogs that I see are in grade three, okay? They also recommend an exercise tolerance test where they trot the dog up and down for, 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 for three minutes or five minutes, depending on the test, and assess its abilities. Now, perhaps you can do that in England or in the northern part of the United States where it's not too hot. If you try and trot a brachycephalic dog like a bulldog up and down in Queensland in the heat, then they they get into severe distress very quickly and collapse. So we don't do exercise tolerance tests, but in some areas they do. So I'm having trouble with slides not advancing, sorry. Okay. And the media as well, um, in some countries, um, Australia and the UK, um, have developed a, a uh, stance on not encouraging the use of breeds with exaggerated or extreme features, Dachshunds, Sharpays, Brachycephalic dogs in advertising. So the, my Australian Veterinary Association, the British Veterinary Association, advises advertisers not to use these animals in advertising, not to promote pictures of um, extreme dogs. 
Unfortunately, that is not the case in, in Asia. I do a lot of work in Asia and it's very common to see um, billboards with brachycephalic dogs. Um, we have a, a, a Love is Blind campaign. You will have access to the slides, so you'll be able to read through that. There's a really good video with, with me on it. It's my mum's favourite video. Uh, and I talk about some of the issues associated with brachycephalic dogs. Another thing that um, we really need to recognise is that many, of, many vets and many owners think their severe breeding problems are just normal for the, for the breed. There was a study um, in, uh, by Packer and a, a, a group of people that found that about 60% of owners didn't recognise the noises that their dog made, the snoring, the snorting, didn't think that was a problem. And also many veterinarians will describe that noise, that, that dyspneic excessive sound as just being normal for the dog's breed. It's, it's, it, and, and if we don't recognize that as a problem, then we can't improve it. So it's undeniable that brachycephalic dogs have many problems. And it's undeniable that these breed problems are a result of selective selection and breeding. Uh, and it's undeniable that man is at fault. We've, we've bred these dogs. Um, there's, there's no, no um, way around that. So um, we need, what can we do about this? It's not Hugh Jackman's fault. It's not a specific breeder's fault. It's the fact, it's the fault of, of, of us as a race, as a species, we've developed dogs that have problems. So we have to fix them. First of all is recognizing that this is a problem, recognize the welfare implications of these breeds and letting our clients know. In, uh, so advising people in a nice and informative way that their dog has a problem and it needs to be treated. But treating one dog doesn't resolve the problem. It helps that dog but it doesn't resolve the problem. So in, there's a, a British working, working group that is made up of, uh, we, we've talked about the makeup earlier, and they have a lot of proposals. And you can read through these if you wish at your leisure, um, but they, they promote the, the assessment of dogs to try and improve the breeding uh, of these dogs, okay, on an individual basis. They also, um, have action plans that, that vets and veterinary nurses can undertake and uh, or veterinary technicians and they also have um, actions that veterinarian veterinary practices can promote con puppy contracts health schemes um, enjoy enroll in in clinical surveillance i think is very important the clan kennel clubs um, are also pushed to try and improve the, the welfare of these deeds. And advertising and marketing, as I said earlier, we need to try and remove these very popular breeds from advertising and marketing, marketing so that they're not promoted and highlighted as desirable, okay, uh, in their current form. Um, and uh, again, I won't go through all these, these points, but we do need to develop some changes in the way we approach these breeds and try and improve the breeds. In some countries, uh, there are other things as well. This is a, um, Trade Me is a New Zealand for sale site like Craigslist or, um, or, or, or I don't know what other ones they have in America. I know they have Hemmings for cars because I collect cars, but, um, so it's sort of like Craigslist, I suppose. You can go on there and buy anything, you know, an engine for your Chev, um, some hay for your horse, whatever you want. But they will not advertise extreme brachycephalic dogs or their crosses because they don't want to contribute to the problem and they're taking a stance as an opportunity to educate potential buyers. Now, they'll advertise your German Shepherd puppies but they won't advertise for sale brachycephalic dogs. And that's a big stance. Okay, so what, what can veterinarians do? Um, we need to lobby 
the for tougher animal welfare legislation, including changes to the breed, breed standards. In some countries, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, they've introduced animal welfare legislation, which makes it illegal to knowingly breed animals that are likely to experience pain, distress or harm. That's a big thing. The Dutch have taken it a little step further. They've said that from 2000, they introduced a law in 2014 and it's now currently active. You can't breed dogs with extreme brachycephaly. It's against the law in Holland. So they have this, what they call a traffic light system and they want breeding to, to increase the length of the nose. They actually want um, the only brachycephalic dogs that are allowed to breed in Holland from this point uh, where the length of the muzzle is at least a third of the head and preferably 50% um, of the head. So they want to reintroduce muzzles in these dogs. Um, and uh, these changes have become uh, quite controversial um, and are becoming more and more accepted worldwide. So this is a really good article. If you want to find this article and read it, I um, mean, animals in 2019, and it reminds veterinarians that it's our moral and ethical role. Uh, we have a moral and ethical role in animal health, and that our role is not only animal treatment, but also improving animal welfare. Okay, I spend most of my time treating animals, and I do it for the reason of animal welfare. Um, there's lots of different strategies, but we need to improve these dogs. We need to improve the length of their muzzles, length of their nose, and um, try and reduce the extreme features, particularly the hemivertebrae in these dogs. So what do I do? You know, do I just sit here and talk to people? No, I have a five-fold approach to brachycephalic dogs. Firstly, <laughs> treat the individual. Okay, it's really important. Training one brachycephalic dog won't change the breed. But not treating a brachycephalic dog means that animal suffers. So we need to treat that dog, but then we need to do other things as well. This is why I treat these dogs. Okay, this is a Australian bulldog. The only reason he's pink is because he's got oxygen in front of him. This dog's in quite severe and marked inspiratory distress. Okay, he is having trouble breathing. These were his venous blood gases on admission. Okay, and we can see um, that, 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 that she's in respiratory acidosis. She's seriously acidotic um, and her bicarb uh, is elevated as well. So she's got a, an un, she's undergoing metabolic response. And this is a chronic condition. And these are her blood gases five days post-operatively. So she had upper airway surgery. We, we resected her soft palate. We opened her ne nostrils. We um, removed her tonsils. We removed her ventricles. And that allowed us to um, uh, improve her breathing. This is her pre-operative breathing. <laughs> this is her three weeks after mm -hmm. surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Remarkable difference. So you must treat the individual. What else do we need to do? We need to, um, when do we treat the individual? Preferably um, around 12 to 18 months of age before we've got significant secondary changes. Um, we need to educate breeders. It's really important that, and I speak to breeding societies regularly on the problems associated with their breed, and I encourage them to consider the welfare of their animals. Because people who breed dogs, they love their dogs, but we need to improve the welfare of their dogs. And we also need to approach the kennel clubs and ask them to make changes to the breeds and the um, association uh, of those breeds. So this is what I'm gonna ask for your help with later on. And of course, ed educate dog owners. Um, many, many dog owners don't understand that their dogs Clinical signs are a problem. They think they're okay. They're not, they can't breathe. 
and also educate veterinarians. So we must prevent veterinarians from considering a dog's breathing difficulty as normal for that dog. So in summary, my approach to these is to know as much as I can about the problem, treat the individuals, educate owners, breeders, kennel clubs, and my colleagues, and love them all, especially the needy. This is a little pug that someone gave me um, because he had so many problems, um, but he's a dear little dog. So what are our moral and ethical obligations? Um, I think there are many, many uh, opinions on this, um, but never be afraid to, to, to say, there's a quote there from a very great man, a man from your country, Never be afraid to do what's right, especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Okay, so if, when we see a problem, it's really important that we try and resolve that problem in all work, walks of life. Now, alternately, we could just all have wolves as pets. Okay, um, they're really healthy animals, but they're not very good as apartment dogs, and they do have problems with small children but they are healthy dogs. That's a joke, I don't advocate with people owning wolves. Okay, so what am I gonna ask you to do? I'm gonna ask you to sign a petition. Um, the link to the petition is on the next slide. And what we're gonna do with this petition is we're gonna try and ask the kennel clubs to change the breed standard. And this has happened in some countries and I'm trying to push for that to happen in uh, Australia, New Zealand and various other countries as well. So by adding your name to this petition, uh, and it's well over 5,000 signatures now, we can try and change uh, these breeds. So um, that's this, the, the petition link there. Um, it's on a, a petition site called Change. And I'm very happy for you to share it with everyone you know, put it on Facebook, put it on all social media. As soon as we have enough signatures, we'll approach the um, the kennel club. So that's all really all I have time for. Um, I'm sorry if we're expecting a, a lecture on surgery. I'm more than happy to do that next time. Thank you. <laughs> this was awesome.